provocatively entitled The Use, Misuse, and Abuse of Evidence-Based Medicine. And I think we'll hear a lot of abuse over the next hour, I hope. Um, and we will, st uh, they are, I'm joined by three colleagues, friends, um, James and Dow, professor in Aberdeen, Peter Remington, a consultant in Eastbourne, and Charlie Thompson, recently moved to Newcastle from Bristol. Welcome all, to all of you. Um, without any further ado, because we are running a few minutes late, um, we'll get started. But I will just mention, during the session, please do uh, go to the app, and you can go there now, and ask a question. And we'll be looking at these uh, as the session goes on. And there'll be time at the end for some uh, questions from the audience. Uh, if all of you are shy and retiring, then I've got plenty of questions myself for the, uh, for the speakers. But um, please do interact, and I'll do my best to uh, accommodate your questions. Um, on our, I've never run a session off my phone, but, um, so forgive me, but uh, James and Dow is going to start us off on telling us uh, how to use evidence-based medicine and guidelines. So please, James. Good afternoon, all. Um, Frank, thank you for the, um, I would say, unwelcome pleasure of being invited to come and talk about how I use evidence. I wasn't quite sure if it was a joke or not, but actually turned out to be serious. Um, so humor me for the next few minutes. Um, I, I suppose um, one has to think about what is evidence. Um, I think when we normally talk to each other about evidence, we're probably thinking about randomized trials, big studies, et cetera, et cetera. But actually, in my view, um, we're surrounded by evidence. Um, if you don't have the highest quality evidence, be it um, system review of large randomized trials, or if you don't have RCTs, you don't have prospective studies, if there are case reports, you can still learn something from them. Um, and my feeling is that you know, where there isn't so-called high-quality evidence and you have a room of experts that know about the subject, well, that is evidence. You know, if they come up with a consensus statement because there isn't higher-quality evidence, um, that, is ex that is evidence, obviously. Patient experience, um, obviously. Important bit of evidence for our practice. Um, and, of course, we've had many centuries of medical history, innovation, we're gonna hear a little bit about innovation today, um, that we learn from. So, I'm gonna be a little bit provocative, I suppose, to deal with how I think we as surgeons, and I'm gonna take some liberties because you probably, none of the above, of course. Um, I think I would say we have a mixture of appreciation and skepticism. Um, Quite healthy, both of them, if used appropriately. But quite frankly, unhealthy when appreciation means that we find and like the evidence that supports what we believe in or our own biases. Um, um, and skepticism when presented with evidence we do not like or does not support what, we, what we've believed all of our career. Those are perhaps not very good ways of dealing with the evidence. We usually like things we publish, and we have this very famous story, which I must tell you. I know the guidelines of his past chair, Keith Parsons, is sitting here, and Karen Plass, of the EAU guidelines office. But I'm led to believe, rumor has it, many, many years ago, there was a guideline where the chairman, um, 60 or 70% of the references at the end of the guideline were his personal publications, right? Um, those days, thankfully, have gone. Keith Parsons ensured that those days have gone. Um, we, we like innovation. We love it, and we're going to hear a little bit about innovation today. We're, craft, we're a craft specialist. We're all surgeons, practicing surgeons. We like new things. We, we innovate on every new patient that we operate on, really. Um, and, uh, so that's healthy. Um, but I think it's unhealthy for us to roll out innovation without proper independent assessment. And I'm not meaning randomized trials, just collecting outcomes of patients, how they do objectively, honestly, um, would be a very good start. Um, it is also quite unhealthy when 
we are driven by our own conflicts. When I say conflicts of interest, people worry about financial conflict of interest. Yes, that is important. But actually, academic intellectual conflict of interest can be equally dangerous. Um, we occasionally mask our inability to cope with the vast amount of information out there by celebrating complete lack of knowledge. You know, we, we're so proud that we sit in the pubs and don't read any papers, right? Um, and actually, that, you know, if we were to tell our patients that we all came into medicine through academic excellence, but now when we're, I'm 49 now, at 49, I don't care much about reading any papers, you know, I, I find it boring, blah, de, blah, de, blah. I'm not quite sure patients, patients are actually going to appreciate that. Worst of all, when there is good evidence, we ignore it. Um, and there are two aspects. One is the potential loss of life. The other is the, the, the potential cost to funders of healthcare. Um, and I think my background, obviously, is in Cochrane. And the Cochrane logo, you may not know this, but the Cochrane logo is one of the, uh, the, the forest plot, is one of our very dark histories where um, many, many years ago, um, for preterm deliveries, there was evidence coming out that showed that corticosteroids reduced preterm delivery deaths. Many, many years went by, and the obstetricians ignored this evidence. Many years. Systematic review came of randomized trials. They still ignored it. Tens of thousands of, of babies likely to have died because of that. Um, the other interesting one closer to home is intravesical chemotherapy for bladder cancer. It doesn't matter what your own personal biases are. The evidence would suggest, based on all the meta-analysis that are done, that actually it reduces recurrence of bladder cancer, etc. But when you look at practice, if you look at some states in the U.S., and Philip Dam, I see him, a good friend of mine sitting in the audience here, some states in the U.S., less than 2%, 0.2% uh, of surgeons were using it. France, probably about 20-something percent. In the UK, because we're so obedient and, and follow rules, 70% um, of us were using it. Um, but that costs money. I mean, recurrence rate for bladder cancer is the, is the, is the untold story of, of the issues that we have by not doing certain things. Why do I use systematic reviews? Um, largely because there's far too much evidence out there. If you were to go and click prostate cancer now in PubMed for the, for the past year, you'd probably hit over 10 or 15 or 20,000 publications. If there are one or two good papers in there for you to find it, you may struggle to find that. So it's, it's extremely difficult for us to keep up. Uh, cinema reviews clearly reduce bias, random error, um, and of course variability. And, and when there is variability in what is published, the cinema review good ones can tend to give you a very unbiased assessment of what they think the outcome is. RCTs clearly are important where you don't have a strong systematic review. If you have a very big, strong RCT, large, multi-center, well done, then, and we'll see an example of that today. I know the, the chief investigator of Suspend Medical Explosive Therapy for Ureteric Stones is sitting here, Sam McClinton, and Frank, of course, was on a triangle steering committee. Um, and that has shown that despite what a meta-analysis of poor trials show that tamsulosin was effective in letting ureteric stones pass uh, quicker. Actually, when we did a big randomized trial um, funded by the HTA here, in, in, in led from Aberdeen, actually, no difference. No better than placebo. But it's almost standard practice across the world. Almost standard practice at the moment. Non-randomized studies, when they're prospective, protocol-driven, um, you can put a little bit of confidence in them, but you still run the risk that um, you will overestimate the effect size, and you cannot, you cannot rule out selection bias. That is the bottom line, that with a non-randomized study, selection bias is an issue. Retrospective studies, well, you can, you know, you can, I'm not saying you can totally ignore it. I think if you don't have anything else, great. But if you have any other um, higher level study, then retrospective studies don't tend to change the direction of effect of what a good prospective study is. I'm making some assumptions in terms of what I believe you, you know. Um, so if I'm, if I'm pitching this too, too low or whatever, do, do please, um, do please um, tell me off after the session. Um, I, I think where you have 
non-randomized studies only to deal with. That's where a good, in a guideline panel, you need a well-balanced panel that have declared all their conflicts of interest and it's managed properly. Then you can hopefully come out with a statement that is useful. The role of the AU guidelines or role of clinical guidelines, I think it's becoming more influential. Sadly, in some areas, they're beginning to be used in a legal way, which it's absolutely not the intention. I know that my American friends probably use it more in that way, but it is absolutely not the intention. The guidelines pr produce, provide guidance. Um, that's all. It doesn't mandate what you should do. Um, clearly, there are some areas where we still need to improve around um, individualizing the care we give to patients. Guidelines are not so good yet in doing that, in helping you do that for that individual patient. Um, I think shared decision making is something that we as urologists must take into account. I think the EAU guidelines are comprehensive. We have about 20 of them, guidelines we produce an update every year. They help you deal with the fact that there's just too much information. Unless you have no hobbies, no friends, don't leave home, you know, then maybe you can look after the evidence yourself. But if you have friends or you have a hobby, then maybe you should use guidelines to help you. Yeah? We gradually um, um, being recognized slowly in terms of the guidelines that are produced, and a lot of this work, as I say, done by my own predecessors, um, one of them sitting right here. A huge amount of work in, in engaging with national societies, and hot of the press, we've got Bowser's uh, endorsement this past week, the French Association, etc. Well, so what's the next steps for the guidelines? Continue to fine-tune our methodology to ensure that um, you know, the, the methods we use are, are on, of the highest level, continue to, to deal with the issue of conflict of interest, um, and, and obviously start measuring the impact of our guidelines. There's no point in the EU spending millions to produce these guidelines, and we don't care whether they're used or, it does, or whether they benefit patients. Um, patient involvement, um, and let me just finish off in this area. I think patient involvement is extremely important meaningful patient involvement, not just um, uh, lip service. We must, as surgeons, start listening to what are the important outcomes for patients, not just what we think are important outcomes. And I think we in the guidelines office need to also start doing better in terms of patient en en um, en engagement. Um, we are now on Twitter over the past six months. I've had to join Twitter. I'm hopeless at it, um, but it's been an interesting learning experience. We're delighted because we're here um, that BJUI um, gave us a, a, a resounding endorsement of the fact that we are now coming out of a little bit of the dark ages. So what's the future for the EU guidelines over the next years? The next 10 years, you will hopefully see us being even more transparent about the conflicts of interest of our panel members so that you as users of the guidelines can make up your mind whether those recommendations you can truly trust. Uh, meaning, meaningful patient involvement, obviously. A realization that these EU guidelines are not ours. These are your guidelines uh, as a urologic community. Um, and really, we do want to hear your feedback as to where we're not doing things well. I, I think keeping up, and this is my final slide, keeping up to date is a challenge for all of us. We're far too busy. There's far too, mu too, too much information out there. So I think the EU guidelines could help you optimize the practice that, that you have. Um, and as I said, it provides guidance only, um, doesn't mandate you to follow it. You have a contract with the patient, so you decide how and when you think it's appropriate to deviate from that. All I'm saying is that when you deviate, you need to have a justified evidence-based reason why you're doing so. And I think finally, I will encourage all of us as surgeons, we, we are all trained and built to be decisive, make decisions like that. But I think it is important for us to be able to ask ourselves the question that what we think we believe in, is that truly correct? We're not good at harboring uncertainty, but I think there is, it's not weakness to be able to say, might the alternative be true? Because I think that allows us to be better surgeons, actually. Thank you, Frank.